So this morning, before I get into my message, I want to give a little Bible history. Now, in first, Saul was the first king of Israel, and he actually ruled for 40 years. And you find in 1 Samuel, I believe it's chapter 13, God sent his messenger, Samuel, to Saul to let Saul know that he was not happy with the disobedience that Saul had been having in his life. And the message that God sent was not a good message, but nevertheless, it was a message that needed to be told. And he was told that he would no longer have the kingdom, meaning that the kingdom would not be passed on to his sons. But God said that he was going to raise up a man after his own heart. You know, and Jackie hit on this on Wednesday when she talked about David. Because that was the man after God's own heart that he raised up. And in Acts 13, when Paul was making his speech in Antioch, he said the same thing. He said that God had removed Saul and he raised up David, a man after his own heart that would do his will. Now, when you look at David's life, God blessed David's life even before he anointed him to be king. From the time he was a young lad, when he was out there with the lion, when he was out there with the bear, when he was herding the sheep, God's hand was on his life and God continued to bless his life. Now fast forward over to 2 Samuel, chapter 12. God sends his messenger Nathan to David's house. Nathan told David the story of a man who had a lot of sheep and his neighbor had one little sheep. But the man with a lot of sheep, he took that neighbor's one sheep and he dressed it. And I mean, David was livid. Such a man does not deserve to live. He has to repay this fourfold. And Nathan had to tell him, David, you the man. So here we have another message. Not necessarily a good one, but a much needed one. And the message that Nathan conveyed to David, well, let me just go back through the story. So I'll make this quick. This is going to be the condensed version, okay? So David had seen Bathsheba. He got Bathsheba. He slept with her. She got pregnant. Uriah was his man of war, was out on the battlefield. David bought him in, tried to get him to go sleep with his wife so they could cover up the pregnancy that she had. It didn't work. Uriah wasn't falling for it. David put Uriah's own death warrant in his hand and sent him back to the battle. And he died on the battlefield. Condensed version, okay? So that's why Nathan is there with the message from God. And God tells David, not only will this baby die that you tried to cover up the mess that you were in, but he said, the sword will never leave your house. 
Now, keep in mind, David had other children. And a couple of those other children were Ammon, and he had Tamar, and Tamar's brother, Absalom. Remember, the sword will never leave your house. Ammon raped Tamar. I call Absalom my patient soul. Absalom, Tamar's, half, Tamar's brother, Ammon was their half-brother, waited two years, and then he killed him. He took revenge for the raping of his sister. The sword wasn't leaving David's house. That being the case, Absalom had to flee Jerusalem, so he left. He was gone for three years in exile. David's heart softened, let him come back. However, he said he could never see his face again. Well, Absalom, my patient one, in the three years that he was out there, do you think he was out there twiddling his thumbs? Nope. He was out raising an army. And when he came back, he was still raising an army. He would sit by the gate, and when men would come in who weren't exactly happy with David, he would say, come to my side. Let me see what I can do for you. So he was winning the people over. Commentators say it was about three or four years when Absalom rebelled against David. And at this point, he had raised such an army that David and the few men that were with him had to flee. So now we got David running out of Jerusalem. I will get to my message, and I won't hold y'all longer than normal. Now, there were, there were only a few men. Absalom had the majority of them. But the mistake that he made was that he didn't think about David being the strategist when it came to war, that he was. So David told Joab and his few men, this is what you do. You go into this forest area. You wait till they come. That's exactly what they did. They killed 20,000 of Absalom's men. That's a lot of men. When Absalom had seen what was going on, he hopped on his donkey. He went hightailing it away from the battlefield. And it says that as he went through the trees, well, let me say this. Josephus says that he had long, flowing hair. And as he went through the trees, he got caught up in the thicket. His donkey kept going, but he was hanging in the thicket. He couldn't get loose. Now, there is some discussion about whether it was his hair or whether it was his armor. Either way, he was stuck. He wasn't going nowhere. So when Joab came, he took three darts and he ran them through. And then he allowed his ten armor bearers to run them through with the sword and kill them. Oh, I should have backed up. When David sent them out, he did tell them, be gentle with the young man Absalom. Joab missed that. He wasn't gentle. So now Absalom's dead. They got to get the message back to David. I'm coming back to the messenger again. And there was a runner. And back in those days, they had runners where they ran back and forth from the battlefield to the king. And, you know, and any message that needed to be given, they ran with this message. So the one runner, his name is Ahamez. He was one of the top runners. He goes to Joab and he says, let me run. Let me take the message to David about the victory. And Joab says, no, you're not going to run today. 
Joab chose an Ethiopian, Cushite. I like to call him Cushy. And he gave Cushy the message to take to David. And Cushy took off running. Ahimez, he kind of reminds me of little kids. You know how they'll ask for something and you say no. And they say, please, 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 still trying to get their way. So Hamaz came back to Joab and he said, let me run, let me run. And Joab said, no. But he kept pushing him. He kept pleasing him. And finally, Joab relented and he said, run. And keep in mind, he did not give Ahimez a message. He just told him to run. And Ahimez took off running. Now, Cushy had started out before him, but somehow Ahimez overtook Cushy and got ahead of him. And so when the watchman on the wall, because David was waiting to hear what was going on in the battlefield, seen the runners coming, he seen the first one, he goes to David, he said, the runner's coming, and he looks like a Hamez, the one that took off second. And David says, good, because back then, if you had one, one messenger running, that usually meant good news. It meant victory. When you had a bunch of runners, there was a problem because they'd be in chase by the enemy, and so having one was a good thing. So he let... Ahimez came in, he greets David, gives him the pleasantries, and he says, victory has been given to you, your enemies are dead. And David says, what about the young man Absalom? Ahimez didn't answer. Now, not exactly sure whether... He didn't answer because he didn't know. Or he didn't answer because he knew that David had a tendency to take out his wrath on people who bought him bad news. So he, he was just silent. So David told him, look, go stand over here. And so now we're waiting for Cushy to come in. Cushy comes in, peace be unto you, David. And the victory is in your hands. Those that rose up against you are now dead. David asked the same question. What about the young man Absalom? And Cushy says, that it be to our Lord King the same thing to all of his enemies that happened to this young man. And basically, with that, he told David Absalom was dead. And David began to grieve, and he grieved for a minute. And then he got up and went on with his life. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I told all that story because in looking at this, I was looking at, <coughs> excuse me, the idea that the messenger that was being sent was very zealous. And I'm talking about a Hamez, very zealous, very energetic, very enthusiastic. <clears throat> but yet, he didn't have the whole message. We live in a society today where there's a lot of messages being preached, a lot of messages being put out there, but either they're a partial truth, not truth at all, but there are very few that have the whole truth. If you turn to Romans 10, you know, originally my thought for this message was, let me run. Because whenever I think about a Hamez, I hear him in my mind going, let me run, let me run. 
But then as I continued to go through the scripture, I thought, zeal is not enough. We have so many people that are zealous, so many people that are enthusiastic, but that just is not enough. You know, I've found in the 30 years we've been doing this, it always looks good from out there looking up here. Oh, yeah, I want to be on the platform. Oh, yeah, I want to preach a word. But it's not just saying I want to preach a word. It's not just saying I want to see how I look up there. But it's saying you got to have something to say. So here in Romans 10, starting with verse 1, it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now here we have Paul, and Paul is talking to the Jews. And they had a passion for God. They had a passion for doing a work for God. But they were lacking in the knowledge of what it took. They were lacking in the fact that it's more than do this, do that, work this up, work that up. And they were missing the fact that the Messiah had come, shed his blood, died on Calvary, and that was the message. And that's what I want to put out there this morning to all of us. The message that we should be conveying as a messenger of God. Now, it could be that maybe some of us are messengers of somebody else. But if we are believers, and I'm not just talking about being up here on the platform and preaching. I'm not talking about preachers. I'm talking about when you're in the grocery store. Or when you're with your family. Or when you're on your job. Or when you're just passing somebody by on the street. You are a messenger. And the message that we should be conveying to the world is Christ crucified. You know, people use the term, the message of the cross. And I make a note and I say it's used so loosely. You know, it, it just, does it not sound good, the message of the cross? It just rolls out of your mouth and falls But the message of the cross isn't just saying the message of the cross. The message of the cross is being able to take somebody and show them the price that Jesus paid. Not because he owed a debt. He didn't owe that debt. We owed that debt. We could not pay that debt. And it's because we could not pay that debt, he came and paid that debt for us. It's because of the love of the Father that sent his Son who was obedient to pay that debt. That's the message that we need to take out to the world. But in addition to that, because, you know, as you look at a lot of the messages that are going forth, love, peace, prosperity. Give me the money. We neglect to see not only is God a God of love, but he is a God of wrath. And it's because of his love that he bestowed upon us, he allowed our sin debt to be paid. See, if we don't take the whole truth, out. We are doing people an injustice. We have to tell them, okay, in a nice way. You don't want to go out and beat somebody on the head and tell them you're going to hell and you're a sinner. And... But we have to call out sin. We don't judge sin, but we do have to call out sin. And we do have to let people know, this is why Jesus died. For your sin. For my sin, 
for all of mankind's sin. This is the message that we need to be conveying to the world. When you look at Ahimez, like I said, he was enthusiastic. He was energetic. He was loyal to David. He wasn't trying to do anything wrong. He just either didn't want to tell the whole truth or he did not have the whole truth. And we have so many preachers out there. They don't want to do wrong. They're not trying to do wrong. But it takes some time in God's word. We have to study to show ourselves approved unto God. If we don't study, if we don't get God's word in us, we have nothing to say. You know, it's time out for telling stories. Now, granted, I did give some history, so yeah, I guess I did tell a story. But it's time out for telling stories that do not tell the story of Christ crucified. There's so many doctrines, so many religions, but there is only one true living God. And as a believer, it's our responsibility. Like I said, it doesn't have to be on the platform. But as a believer, it is our responsibility to tell people the whole truth. I have a friend, and my friend's child is gay. And I can remember when he was young, and she told me, I was like, oh, he's just confused. We'll pray about this. Well, he still confused. And the time came when I had to tell her, you have got to be real with your son. You have got to let him know that this is not the life that God has chosen for him. This is not the way that God wants him to live his life. This is how the world sucks us in. The world sucks us in, be it by music, by TV. Now, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I do watch what I watch. And it now never ceases to amaze me that it does not matter what I am watching, unless it's one of Charlie's animated shows about ABCs and 123s. But if I'm watching TV, TV, a show, Have you ever noticed how they always work it in? Have you ever noticed how it's acceptable to do certain things? And what they are doing is they are desensitizing us so that we can call evil good and call good evil. Because if I do not accept it, then that means something is wrong with me. If I do not accept it, if I take a message that talks about what Jesus did, then I don't have any love. But we have to be willing as messengers of God to tell the stone-cold, hard, whole truth. I always say, when I lay my head on the pillow at night, I don't want to, if I don't wake up in this world, and I wake up standing in front of Jesus, I don't want it to be oh, I should have told so-and-so such and such. Oh, I should have, should have let them know what Jesus did. But we have to make a decision. What type of messenger do we want to be? Like I said, Ahamas, there was nothing wrong with Ahamas. He loved David. He was loyal to David. He had been running for David for a long time, before he even went into exile. But he refused to tell the whole truth. We cannot refuse to tell the whole truth. We need to be cushy. We need to be running with the message that God has given us. And he has commanded us to take his word out to the world. So we need to be running with that message. The message we need to be running with is the message of the cross. 
The message we need to be running with is to tell people, Jesus died for your sins. That being the case, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have come new. That means you do not have to stay in the same mess that you've been living in for the last 30 years. That message is what brings life. That message is what draws people up out of the muck and mire that they have been living in for year after year after decade after decade. But unless we take that message out to the world, Who's going to take it? The world's not going to take it. Psychology's not going to take it. Buddha is not going to take it. Who's going to take it? We use the term Christian. Christian means Christ-like. If we are not Christ-like, We are not Christians. Jesus paid the best example for us in every aspect of our life. His message that he brought to the world was that I have to die. I have to pay this sin debt. So we want to take the message of Jesus out to the world. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in, well, I want to do this. And you know, I don't know if it's as bad as it was prior to all the social media stuff, but I can remember once upon a time, any time you got, well, not any time, but a lot of the times, you got somebody's business card. It said they were an apostle, prophet, evangelist. You know, they had some some name on there. Didn't matter whether or not they had a message. They just had a name. But now we live in this new world. And you got social media. And I tell you, just do a search on prophets. Now, I'm not talking about you're going to pull up an Isaiah or Jeremiah. You're going to pull up Anna Mae Sue that lives down the street. Billy Joe Bob around the corner. Because people are putting these titles, they're calling themselves a messenger of God, and they have no message. And it gets even worse because we sometimes support these people. Let me just throw that out there. Because we do. Because, oh, he's such a great man of God. Did you hear that word that he preached? He told me such and such and so and so. And I don't want to go into it because then it gets too close, too personal. Well, did he ever preach about Jesus? Did, Did he ever call... Call them by name. I had somebody near and dear to my heart. And they started going to this church. Not this church. A church. And I was telling them, I said, well, what are they preaching? Oh, it's a good word. It's a good word. Okay. What are they preaching? Well, I'm going to send you this link so you can listen to it. But you have to wait until about the last five or six minutes of the the message. The message was over an hour. But I got to wait until the last five or six minutes to hear him say Jesus. And in those five or six minutes, that's what he said, Jesus. But man, he got a good word. That message was just so good. I'm like, what are you hearing? What message are you receiving? What is it that you are allowing to come into your spirit? Saints, we need the whole truth. We need a messenger who is going to tell us the whole truth. Now, when you look at the message that Cushy took, it wasn't all good because 
In addition to the victory, he had to tell David that his son was dead. So don't think every time you come into these walls that the message is going to be good. There's sometimes God's going to have to send a word that makes us just a tad bit uncomfortable. But one thing we can be thankful for is knowing not only do we receive the whole truth, but when we go out and we're talking to somebody and we're sharing God's word with them, we give them the whole truth. We don't sugarcoat it. We don't try and cover it up. But we give them the whole truth. Jesus came and died for your sin. And unless you repent and ask for forgiveness, you are a sinner. And hell is your destination. Not necessarily because of what you're doing, but it's because of what you believe. Because if you believe right and believe that Jesus died for your sin, you would quit doing that sin. And that's the message that we have to take out to the world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most holy and righteous Father, God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for giving us the truth over and over and over again. Father, I just thank you right now because you love us enough to chastise us. You love us enough that you sent your son and that you allow us to be able to take that message out to the world and share it for others to be able to receive it. And I just ask that you continue to keep your hand upon our lives, Lord. Continue to lead and guide us. Help us, Lord, to have more of a hunger for your word so that we can study your word, so that we have something to say to somebody. And God, we just give you all the praise and all the glory in your holy name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. That was a on-time word. Very, very needed word. Because it's so easy to have zeal and think you know what you're doing. But unless you sit down and truly hear from the Lord and read His word, um, you know, you're not in the will of God. So just thank you, God, for that word. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. If you haven't given, please go ahead and do so. We definitely need your support. As you guys know, there are several ways to give. If you are online, just go ahead and um, scroll down and hit the donate. And if you're in-house, you can text to give. You can give in the um, kiosk or the baskets at the back. Also, one event that is coming up is our prayer set this Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, Luke 18, 1 says men ought to pray always and not faint. So please come out. Um, this That's this October 19th at 10 a.m. to 12. Um, and of course, you can, you know, come as you um, want to. You can stay for 10 minutes or for the whole two hours if you please. So once again, this Saturday at 10 a.m., come and, um, you know, just join us and pray. And that is it for announcements. Please rise and I will pray and dismiss us. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you because in you is life, in you is truth, Father. Thank you because we don't have to search, Lord. Thank you because we are confident in this truth that is you, that is your son. Father, help us to be fishers of men, Lord. Help us to speak the truth and the whole truth, Father. And Lord, if we don't know this truth, if we're not sure, Lord, help us to study, Lord. Help us to seek your truth, Father. Help us to be led by your Spirit, Lord. And help us not to miss the chances, Father, that you give us every single day to be light. Lord, whether it's at the gym, at work, at just wherever, Lord. Lord, you are always giving us chances to be light. So help us to be bold and help us to simply open our mouth knowing that you will feel it, Lord. Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. You are dismissed. See you guys on Wednesday.